<laughs> Just be normal. <laughs> Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd of the Fish Nerds Podcast. And I'm Zoe, Clay's kid, and I'm 10. Hey, happy birthday, Zoe. Thank you. So, hey, you had a birthday. You're 10 years old. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. What's that mean to you? It's 10 to me. Um, a bearded dragon? You're a bearded dragon. That's not a fish. I know it's not a fish. Are you surprised you didn't get a fish? No. No. Okay. So, a pet bearded dragon, and do you fish? Uh huh. All right. Tell me about your fishing. Well, I love to catch big fish that become our dinner. But you like to eat the fish you catch. I like to eat my fish. And what kind of fish have you caught this winter? I've caught yellow perch, white perch, crappie. I'm not sure what else, Dad. Have I caught anything else? I can't remember. You have. Uh, uh, did you catch any yellow perch? That was just the first thing on my list. Did you catch any black crappie? That was the final thing on my list. Did you catch any white perch? That was one of the things on my list. You probably caught a fall fish. Oh, and I also caught a fall fish. Hey, yeah. cool. So yeah, caught a lot of fish and beaten some of them too, and they're delicious. Definitely. What's your favorite way to have fish cooked? I like it battery and fried in tacos. Uh, battered and fried in tacos. Fish tacos are fabulous. One of my favorite things. So... Yeah, so you're on the podcast because nobody else was free tonight to co-host, and I thought, you know, you're 10, maybe it's time to have you doing some work and earn a living for a change. Yeah. So I I need to apologize. Last week's show, I called you useless, and I'm sorry for that. Gosh, (laughs) dude. You didn't listen, though, did you? No, I didn't. You you know why you don't listen to my show? Because it's not a kid's show. Yeah, I know that. I know that. Yeah, so that's why. But today, you're on it. And we've got a lot to do today, but first, um, my friend Rich Collins is teaching me how to fly fish. Cool. Yeah, so this year I'm going to become very good at fly fishing, as Rich is going to teach us. And he has a little segment on the show called the Effin' Fly Fishing Minute, and we're going to play that right now. All right, sounds good. Sounds good. Hello, nerds! This is Rich Collins, your fly fishing correspondent, uh, here to talk to you today about some fishy things. Luckily, I've been pretty engaged in uh, the nerd community and involved in all kinds of fishy stuff. It's been pretty fun to kind of open my eyes, perspective, horizons, etc., etc., explore new fish species and types of fishing. So, I'm pretty excited by that. Ice fishing season has just about run its course, it seems like, though there is still ice up north and there still is opportunity, but my eyes have turned to early spring fishing, which has uh, always been a bit of a challenge to me, I'll be completely honest. Um, I am not an expert early spring fisherman or winter fisherman when it comes to flies, I can tell you that right now. Of course, as a Collins perch expert, I'm actually not expert at catching any type of fish except maybe small, insignificant perch. But I never met a fish that I didn't like, so I'll I'll take Collins perch when I can get them. Um, But what I want to talk about is this crazy, crazy world of really cold weather river fishing on a fly. Um, I, again, don't know an awful lot about the science or the behavior of fish this time of year. It's... um, It's March going on April. The water is quite cold here. Um, I've been out a few times in one of our local rivers that is stocked. It's not a wild river down here in southern New Hampshire near Boston. There just isn't, uh, there is, there's not very many native trout that survive, um, if any. There's very few left. So they are very, very heavily stocked. There's a private organization that stocks and the state stocks some of our rivers here, which is awesome. I mean, it gives tons of opportunity and they make it catch and release, not fly only, but single hook only. Um, so the fish stay alive and um, they've survived. They were stocked in the fall. They've made it through this entire season and they're just starting to emerge um, for us to fish with now that the ice has receded a bit. So um, I've been a few times this year, um, always with a fly rod. Uh, it makes it more interesting and mostly fishing nymphs. 
Um, I took a water temperature after I walked on some ice, fell through some ice, did all kinds of things trying to get out to some of these fishing spots. Um, it's kind of rough. Uh, the water itself in uh, one particular river is 36 degrees. I threw my thermometer in there, got a temp, and was like, wow, it really is cold. Um, so the first key is to dress really, really warm, which I don't think I uh, have clothes that will <laughs> allow me to get that warm. Um, ice fishing, this is actually colder because half the time you're wading in the water. So you've got that 36 degree water circulating around your waders and your boots. So it's pretty rough, but um, enough about that. Let's talk about the fish and the fishing. Now, it's winter. You don't think much is going on. Um, the water's really cold, but we've had uh, emerging sun, and the sun's done a little bit of uh, a little bit of its thing. It's done some warming of the air. It's done some, you know, psychological whatever's in the fish, and most importantly, the insects' minds that they should start acting a little bit. And it's produced um, very visible. I won't call them hatches because they're not blowing off the water, but it's producing insect life that is emerging from this frigid water and actually crawling up on the ice and snow. And they are um, tiny stone flies of various colors. There's dark black ones, and then there's a light tan one that we've noticed. And then we've also noticed hulls and or um, shells and or just basically um, midges, insect life. A midge is anything that's small, small, small and uh, not very interesting to the human eye, but a lot of these winter or cold water um, rivers, that's the only thing there is to really uh, eat that these trout, and these are big trout, that they feed on. Um, so apparently year-round there are midges hatching or moving around in these waters. Um, and if a trout eats enough of them, it's you know a good food source. But with everything's metabolism kind of shut down for the cold weather, um, there's one particular aspect of this type of fishing that I'm not crazy about, but it also makes it challenging, and that's that uh, they tend to feed on these little tiny nymphs or midges. Um, which are on the bottom crawling around as, as i mentioned some of them are starting to hatch um, so they have to release themselves from the bottom and get up on something to get out of the water to kind of you know spread their wings and and um, i didn't see them fly but that's eventually the, the goal um, so trout are ready handily available to slurp them up as they as they see them um, they're not huge abundance, which is why I'll say there's not a hatch. They're not uh, flying off the water. There's not swarms of them. You'll just basically see a couple here and there um, crawling around or digging themselves out of the snow. And it's kind of interesting because you don't think there's life when it's, you know, 40 degrees out and the water's 36. You think everybody's shut down, but they're not. So the fish are there and um, they're feeding, they're just in really kind of energy conservation mode. And this is the part that uh, I hope some of you can chime in at. This is the part that drives me crazy because I get a big kick out of when fish are active and aggressive and, you know, crazy out of their mind, gonna get that meal. Um, this time of year, they're looking for a very easy meal to the point they almost need you to drag a fly in front of their nose, perhaps tickle them with it just to get them to bite. And then if they do bite, they're just going to kind of sip, slurp. They're not going to attack it. Um, so this type of fishing involves um, traditional wet nymph fishing, I guess you can call it. It's the best way to call it, which um, on a fly rod is... Yeah, it's not too different than, than every other type of spin fishing, um, especially since we use a strike indicator, which is a plastic round object that you assemble on your line up on your leader. Um, it looks very similar to a bobber. It behaves very similar to a bobber. Um, it smells like a bobber and it's a bobber. Um, <laughs> don't want to get to uh, get my fly guys all bent out of shape, but we use bobbers and below that bobber, which you call a strike indicator, you very easily set up your nymph rig, which is little more than um, the rest of the leader, maybe a foot or two of leader, um, followed by tippet, a light tippet, um, three and a half pound, five pound test tippet, fluorocarbon if you have it, costs more, but it sinks better, and uh, fluorocarbon is not as visible to the fish. It's very translucent, transparent in the water. Um, and on that, you usually do a dropper, which is uh, a larger fly, like a woolly bugger, which could simulate anything from a minnow to a leech, and then trail off that another piece of fluorocarbon um, with a tiny, tiny size 22, 24 um, midge, essentially, which is 
basically a hook with a little bit of uh, fur on it, maybe a bead head, um, just tiny, tiny little things. So think of a mosquito larva and uh, you'll have a, a midge nymph. Um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of them, uh, but they all kind of work the same if you match the hatch, which is usually what you try to do. Just basically generally compare color, size, and maybe some of the characteristics of what you're seeing coming out of the water. Or if you get into the fish's stomach or their mouth to see what they're feeding on, that's another way. Um, tip over rocks, just basically find out what's going on underwater and what these fish might be eating. So what we do is very simply, we've got our fly rod, um, fly line on our leader is a bobber down a bit um, you can stack up some split shot very very light split shot and then you'll have your regular um, attractor fly I'll call it um, woolly bugger something something heavy that can sink and then below that you'll have a trailing nymph um, which you more or less want to dance off the bottom of the of the river um, so you throw this contraption out there. The bobber floats. Uh, you got to have a nice even drag on the water. If anything's too fast, too slow, um, it just doesn't look right. That uh, woolly bugger will drag, you know, the weight down, and below it will come this trailing tiny little nymph that simply bounces up and down on off the rocks or off the bottom and it looks like a nymph that's crawling on the rocks that either is trying to aim for the surface to hatch or just lets loose from the rocks and the current take um, take it down so the trout wait for these guys these little tiny um, insects to break loose and then they just simply slurp them up they suck them right up um, they don't make a big deal out of it because these aren't big meals these aren't uh, you know high value meals they need a lot of them but they just sit wherever they are um, close to the bottom and, 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 and pick these guys off just um, left and right. So it's a very, I don't know, it's not the most uh, exciting type of fishing, but they're there, you know they're there, you know they're feeding, and it's a lot of work, so it's really challenging. So you do a lot of this nymphing, um, which is basically repeating the same casts over and over again, remembering that these fish aren't going to travel very far. So they're not going to see it, you know, six feet away and come attack it. You really have to, you have to cover water um, incredibly well. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to be a really good nymph fisherman, neither of which I tend to have a lot of. So um, I tend to beat the water a lot, get mad, get cold, and move on and wait for things to heat up. But um, this time of year, definitely you can get out fly fishing and uh, you definitely can score some nice fish so hopefully I've got a couple um, photos that we can put up uh, to show you some of the rainbows that I got I did not get a brown yet this year but I sure I'm trying um, always Collins perch you know they're, they're nothing too exciting but uh, right up my alley they swim and they bite on my hook that's all I need in life <laughs> so I would love some uh, input on how you guys tackle your early spring fishing um, you know I, I know a lot of states it doesn't really start until a certain time in April I think April 1st is probably the norm for, for a lot of uh, northeastern states to really get into the season but we are allowed to fish certain rivers here year-round and, and these are just for um, for kind of this purpose these rivers are here for our early and, and winter enjoyment so that being said, let's try to take advantage of our uh, Fish Nerds podcast group. I'd love to see some uh, pictures of your rigs. I know we've got some great tires out there that are communicating, and we've got um, some examples already coming in of, of flies being readied for the season. Um, so let's keep that going. It makes it interesting when some of us are not on the water that have to work. It's a great way to break up my day, so keep it up, nerds. Um, I appreciate it, and keep up all the ideas about everything from shad fishing on because it's really opening up the whole world to me so i'm still after my pike though i've kind of started thinking about trout which will slowly evolve into striped bass will be here soon and will slowly evolve into all the warm water and pretty much everything's about to hit <laughs> um, so i look forward to more fishing i look forward to chasing some shad this year and i look forward to teaching clay um, and his merry band of nerds a little bit more about fly fishing now i'm not going to take him out in the winter <laughs> 36 degree water and have him dance a nymph um, gloriously off the bottom over and over again slow slow fishing um, not all that fun kind of reminds me of going out as a kid with dad or uncle um, when the fishing wasn't good and you just sat there and wanted to cry so we're not going to do that we're going to wait for the fishing to heat up before we whip out the fly rods but i mean it's coming it's going to come quick so um let's go 
I'm looking forward to a great fishing season, lots of nerdy action. Um, I enjoyed listening to Clay quiz all the people at Kittery Trading Post about Collins Perch. Um, I was glad someone knew, while she didn't overtly express her desire to chase small, very pretty, wonderful fish like I would, um, you know, she knew what they were. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting famous. Not just regular famous, you know, fish nerd famous. <laughs> so I'd like to thank my friend Scotty J. Farrar for the music here and uh, wish you all a great spring. Well, that was cool, huh? Definitely. Best advice I've ever heard. Uh huh. What was, your, what, was your, what was your favorite part about it? I can't really tell. I liked it all. Oh, excellent. Good answer. And he seems like a nice person, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So today's show, Zoe, we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to start by talking about bad fishing advice. And then we're going to move into talking about uh, bad ideas in fishing, like using lead. Do you, do you know anything about lead? Uh huh. I you? know that. It is a neurotoxin. It is, yeah. Good. <laughs> it's a good memory of you. That's excellent. And that it kills moons. It kills moons. <laughs> <laughs> it kills loons. It kills loons. That's correct. But so I put out on Facebook, Zoe, I said to, to the Fish Nerds Nation, I said, uh, what's the worst fishing advice you ever got? Now, have you ever gotten bad fishing advice? I think plenty of times. Yeah. yeah. What's the worst piece of fishing advice you've ever been given? Probably to jig really high and fast. Yeah. And a lot. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. No, it doesn't. What works for you for jigging? If I j if you if you jig it up just a little bit, bit like an inch up every few minutes or two, the fish will be more attractive. And when you start getting nibbles. You, you kind of s just wiggle it back and forth a little bit, and it gets the fish's attention. And then you set the hook. And you I've noticed fish. that even when I don't have my computer stuff. Even when you're not using the sonars, yeah. yeah. Now, one thing uh, we took your class, your fourth grade class, fishing, right? Uh huh. And what I thought was really fun is we had the sonars, and all your classmates were using the sonars. Yeah. What did you do? I didn't fish with a sonar. No, you sat on a bucket, right? Yep. And how long did you fish? Maybe 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And how many fish did you catch? Six. Six. Right. And you got more fish than anybody the whole day. And you didn't fish at all since after that. The rest of the day, you didn't fish at all. <laughs> Just fishing on a bucket. For 10 minutes. For 10 minutes. So pretty, pretty great. Yeah. So on Facebook, the worst fishing advice people have been given, our friend Jeff. Jeff is our fish nerds librarian. Cool. Yeah. Jeff says, uh, he says, when you want, his best, worst advice he was given, when you want to catch catfish, Fish in the deepest water. T turns out that's complete crap. Excuse the language. Catfish go where the food is, and that's often in very shallow water. In fact, he goes on to say the biggest blue catfish he ever caught was in less than 10 feet of water because that's where the shad were. That's cool. It is cool. Now, I catch a lot of catfish in really shallow water, too. Same reason. They come right on in. Uh -huh. No problem. They don't care. The fish. Yeah. Uh, Vinny, you know Vinny? Yeah. So Vinny says, worst fishing advice he ever got was to go fishing with Rich Collins. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So, yeah, there's that. <coughs> uh, Brian McGilvra, when cleaning a fish, save the tail so you can fry them and eat them. He was told they taste as good as potato chips. What do you think about that? I That sounds like it would taste a lot like cardboard mixed with fish with bread. Yeah, it's actually, the fins are not bad, but not quite as good as chips. My advice, if you want chips, eat chips. Yeah, that's right. a good advice. Uncle Rob, he said uh, his be his best, worst advice was he should go fishing. But when he goes, nobody ever catches fish. So don't fish with Uncle Rob. Uh, my friend Clayton, who uh, is from the Plum Island Surfcaster, says fish bite more when it's raining. That's kind of so and so. They come up closer to the surface when it's raining. Do they? I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think they come up to the surface. We catch, 
we did catch a lot of fish in this with um, different poles when mm-hmm. it was raining mm-hmm. at camp last summer. Mm-hmm. Like when it was raining, the ones that only have a certain amount of string that you have to put right in, the fish were closer to that rod. Yeah, we were doing some tenkara fishing in the summer, and in the rain, we definitely caught more fish. I, I think on that, yeah. I think what happens, I think it depends. I think what happens. I think what happens when it rains is uh, there's low pressure and all the little detritus, all the little bits and bobs from the bottom of the lake float up and the fish yeah. just eat more. So Yeah. Yeah, but we'll see. All right, uh, Justin Moen says the fish aren't biting. He was just out there. That was uh, That's the advice. A fish, so someone said, the fish aren't biting. I was just out there. Someone was lying to him. Go Fish Dan was told, no need to fish during the midday because fish only eat in the morning and at night. Have you ever caught fish in the middle of the day? Um, like at lunchtime? Yes, no. Yes, you have. Maybe sometimes. Yeah. <coughs> Some Hardly ever. I get the after bite and before bite. You like the morning bite? I like the morning bite. Yeah, that day you caught all those fish. It was like first thing in the morning and the fish <laughs> were like, fish, 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 fish. Yeah. That yeah, was totally fun. Uh, Spencer says, definitely people saying midday or bright calm day bite is bad, but he caught his personal best small mouse at high noon. So, you know. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, and uh, Rich Collins back again. Run your offering through the water about three times. If they are hungry, they'll bite. Otherwise, just move on to the next spot. I find that you can sometimes spend hours in the same spot trying to get the presentation right. Once you do it, the fish turn on, and it's lights out. All right, Ryan Dubay says Silver Lake. Oh, yeah, and fish with that Rich Collins guy. Two pieces of bad advice. (laughs) Poor Rich. What did? What? What did he say? He said, Ryan Dubay says the worst fishing advice he ever got was to fish Silver Lake. Oh, yeah. And fish with that Rich Collins guy. So, Rich, no one likes to fish with Rich. Fish with Rich. That's not nice. It's not nice. And Rich is very nice. He gave us the, um, uh-huh. he gave us the uh, rock band for our Nintendo. Yeah. Yeah. So, we like that guy. Uh, Joe. Pichico says, when fishing for trout, wade out up to your chest and cast as hard and as far as you can. Don't forget your one-ounce sinker and size 8 treble hook with a half a jar of power bait. LOL. I think he's being facetious. Yeah. What does LOL mean? Love. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Taylor Miller says, actually, buying the Bill Dance Dance and Eel. The thing looked fantastic on TV, but after a few tries, it couldn't even sell it at a yard sale. So... The uh, Bill Dance eel looks like a um, a regular fishing lure, like a crankbait with a rubber tail on it. Weird. Weird, yeah. Uh, Donna Beyer, that is Vinny's mom, says, A gentleman came up to me on the water to tell me at length that I was casting wrong. I should be casting with my right hand. I'm left-handed. After politely, politely explaining this to him and still being told I did, it didn't matter, no one was left-handed, and I needed to do things the right way, I thanked him and went back to fishing. Now I would promise him that I was possessed by the devil at the start. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Was, was it Vinny? <coughs> it was probably, yeah, Vinny. Hey, Mom, you can't be left-handed. That's not a real thing. Come eat some ice cream. Yeah. All right. Scott Naholdi... Nah- I don't know. I said that wrong. Guy at Dick's Sporting Goods told him he should ice fish at a designated trout pond. And then he told him he should read the rule book before going out fishing. You can't you can't uh, fish those ponds in the winter. So he got bad advice. Yeah. Although the fishing's probably excellent. Yeah, definitely. You, I mean, it's the one that fishes there, right? All right. Dave Callum. You know Dave? Yep. Dave says, when he was like 10 years old, I went to Sears and asked for a fly fishing reel for my dad. Salesperson sold me a big red Abu Garcia bait casting reel and told me it was for fly fishing. And his dad returned it. And Vinny's back again. He honestly cannot think of any bad fishing advice. (laughs) Yeah. We can't think of any more. He had bad fishing advice at the beginning. That's right. I think he was being sarcastic. Mm-hmm. So that's people's bad fishing advice. If you've had bad fishing advice, go to the uh, Fish Nerds Facebook page and share it with us. And the interesting thing about bad advice is sometimes bad advice is good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like what? Bad advice, like the early fish gets the worm. Yeah, the early bird gets the worm. Uh-huh. That, that, 
the early bird gets the fish. Gets the fish. That's right. If you right. get on the lake right away, I always catch the fish early on. You do. When everyone else is setting up. <laughs> That's exactly. You just get fishing right away. That's just smart. get the fish away from all the other people because they'll leave after. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so that was the bad fishing advice. About some fish in the news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You say, I love fish in the news. Me too. No, you <laughs> say, I love. I love fishing the news. You love fish in the news. All right, here mm-hmm. we have a little bit of news out of Hollywood. And this is about octopus. The headline, this is from the Huffington Post. And the, the headline is, Gwyneth Paltrow won't eat octopuses because they're so smart. And she has a point. While musing with Goop co-workers at a group Slack chat with Gwyneth Paltrow... <laughs> made a pretty salient point about not eating octopus. By the way, would you eat an octopus? Probably not. Probably not, unless I was in a very popular octopus or squid plate. So I'd eat a squid, not an octopus. So you'd be okay with squid? Squid, if they were like squids from a a place where squid is really popular. Mm Mm-hmm. But probably not up here. I bet it would be really greasy and not good. Well, they don't throw squids up in uh, the mountains. Exactly. Exactly. In a screenshot of the conversation that made the rounds via Twitter on Sunday, the 44-year-old actress argued against eating the sea creature. Octopuses are too smart to be food, she wrote. They have more neurons in their brains than we do. I had to stop eating them because I was so freaked out by it, and they can escape from SeaWorld and stuff by unscrewing drains and going out to sea. So that's her tweet. Wow. Yeah, wow. The conversation later expanded to cover whether squid, a fellow cephalopod, is okay to eat or not, though opinions were more divided on that topic. The incident Paltrow mentioned was an octopus escaping into the sea is true. Though it didn't happen at SeaWorld, it didn't eat unscrewed drain. <laughs> in 2016, an octopus named Inky escaped from its home at the National Aquarium in New Zealand. According to New York Times article, documented to escape Inky, it's a good name by the way, yeah. Went through the top of his tank, slithered eight feet across the floor, then made his way down a 164-foot-long pipe to the sea. Many other octopus escapes have been documented over the years, some by unscrewing tanks or wiggling out of tight spaces. Octopuses are highly evolved and specialized, says Roger Hanlon, a professor at Brown and senior scientist at Maine Biological Lab- Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, said a, a live article. They are the largest, most complex brain of any invertebrate animals on Earth. And here's a little video, Zoe, of an octopus escaping from a jar. So right now there is an octopus inside of a jar. Which, by the way, is not nice. No, it is not nice. So what's going on now? Now he's going to try to get out. So now he's twisting the cover. Mm -hmm. Twisting. Twisting, trying to figure out how to get out. Twisting the lid. Right now, he's still twisting. Do you think he's thinking righty tighty, lefty loosey? Uh, no. No. <laughs> he's out. He's out. Now, a cool thing about octopuses, Zoe, is they have brains in their arms as well. Yeah, I knew that. And their brains will keep on fighting the fish that pulls it off. If it falls off, mm-hmm. they'll keep on fighting the fish until for a long time the nerves. They're like this big balls of goo and arms. Yeah, well, that are really smart. Now, um, my friend Hugo eats octopuses. Oh, cool. Yeah, and he likes them a lot. I've never had one that I've liked. I've eaten them, and I don't like them. They don't taste good. Um, but I don't use their brains as the reason I don't eat them. But I think that's a fair reason not to eat them. Yeah. Yeah, people can eat whatever they want, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Like, lots of things have the good brains mm-hmm. like i've never met a person that eats rats but i bet there is someone in the world and rats have 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 actually very smart and intelligent brains oh, about pigs yeah pigs pigs are smart pigs right are very smart and delicious and i think that the smarter the animal the better it tastes except for the fact of an octopus except for octopuses right 
But like pigs are delicious. Cows, yeah. Cows are smart and delicious. Uh-huh. Babies, yummy. What? <laughs> All right. Let's move on. <laughs> so that's Fish in the News. Babies are not smart. So I was on a Facebook page the other day, Zoe, and there was a discussion. Someone posted on that discussion. I'm going to read you. I'm going to read you what they person wrote. You ready for this? Uh-huh. They wrote, so when are we fishermen going to push back against this lead law? I mean, maybe not get rid of it totally, but have it rewritten. Shouldn't be all lead. Should only be lead sinkers. Painted jigs with hooks should be excluded. So many types of lures that aren't made without lead, not to mention the price of these bir- of the bird people. <laughs> okay, they need to work on his wording here. But uh-huh. not to mention the price of the bird people can make the law no reason why we can't get it rewritten to not completely screw us. So he feels lead should be okay to use. How do you feel about lead in fishing gear? I think it can, should be completely banned from the USA. Wow, that's pretty pretty strong, bold statement. Because if a loon eats lead, it's dead. Okay, so I came across this article by a person named Ted Williams. All right, let me give you a little background who Ted Williams. He was a baseball player, but not the same Ted Williams I'm going to read you about now. This Ted Williams, Ted Williams detests baseball, but is obsessed with fishing, as was the real, or as he much prefers, late Ted Williams. When he finds really what he what he finds really discouraging is when readers meet him in person and still think he's a frozen baseball player. They say Ted Williams is frozen cryogenically until they can find a cure for his disease. Weird. Yeah, Google it. Um, what do you mean cure for his disease? <coughs> I don't know what Ted Williams died of, but it was a disease, and he thought if I f- if he freezes his body in maybe a hundred years, they have a cure for his disease and they can save him. Weird. Isn't that cool? I'm gonna have you cryogenically frozen. When you, if you, when you die. What about you? I'm going to be long. I'm going to live forever. That means you have to be frozen. Excellent. Bad idea. The surviving Ted writes full-time on fish and wildlife issues. In addition to freelance for national publications, he serves as the conservation editor for Fly, Rod, and Reel, where he contributes a regular feature-length column. Uh, I had I, I actually talked to Ted um, a couple days ago and recorded the conversation. I'm going to play that in a minute, but first let's... Read a little bit of Ted's article on on loons that he just wrote. Yeah, loons and lead. Yeah. So uh, this, this article is from uh, Cool Green Science, and it's uh, relatively new. It came out in de- November 2016, and its title is Recovering. Recovery, Saving Loons and Lead Fishing Tackle. Saving Loons from Lead Fishing Tackle. All right. This is now he lives on Big Island Pond, and our, we have a friend named Tom lives down there as well. So I know, oh. yeah. A night silence settled over Big Island Pond in southern New Hampshire when we lost whippoorwills. But about 20 years ago, common loons showed up for the first time in even my grandparents' memory. The territorial song of the males, which sounds like <laughs> wild discord <laughs> yodeling starts at the end of our island and is answered at the other. Then contact calls soft, owl-like hoots, and wails like the whistles of a distant freight train. By day, tremolos as the heavy black and white checkered birds descend in swift flight, hitting the water and skidding sideways like ditching aircraft. In May 2009, I watched a loon haul onto our beach. It couldn't hold up its head. It quivered. Its ruby eyes grew dull. Three hours later, it was dead. Whoa. Whoa. A neurotoxin had destroyed cells in its liver, kidneys, eyes, and brain. That neurotoxin was... Lead. Lead. Thank you. A lead sinker as small as a split shot will do that. Now, loons yep. face hazards we can't do much about. Um, what do you think things we can't control loons or uh, dangerous we to loons? We can't control invasive species like zebra clams. Right. Zebra mussels. Good. Zebra mussels. Yeah. Oh, right, which are invasive to one the great one of the Great Wait Lakes. That's true. That's very true. And, and mercury, we can't do much about anymore. That's already there. No. But lead fishing tackle, however, is a hazard we can do something about. Mm-hmm. Non toxic metals include what? What do you think? Copper. Copper's great. Iron. Iron, sure. That's getting rusty though. Steel. Metal. Yeah, metal. Tungsten. 
What's tungsten? That's what we've been fishing with all winter. Oh. Yeah, but it's it's actually it's. Uh, Ted writes it's heavier than lead. I'm gonna argue it's it's more dense than lead. Yeah, I'd argue that too. Yeah, because density is is a ratio of mass and volume. So for its size, uh-huh. it is heavier than lead. And if you brought it to Mars, it would be a different weight than here. That's probably true. It is true. <laughs> the different amount of gravities determines the weight. That's very true. Okay, so non-toxic hold up better than lead. Don't snag as easily. Keep tackle boxes cleaner and are safe for humans. Now there are even ceramic or natural rock sinkers. That and sounds like a better idea than yeah. Now, when I was a kid, Zoe, we used lead, and we would take the sinkers and put them around a piece of a fishing string and then bite them with our teeth and smash them on. And even a tiny piece of lead can cause brain damage. That's why my hair is falling out. <laughs> Outside the Great Lakes, <laughs> lead tackle is a leading cause of adult loon mortality. In New Hampshire, for example, 48% of dead adult birds turned into the Loon Preservation Committee were poisoned by lead. The committee and its partners rope off nesting sites, erect buoys and, and warning signs, deploy nesting rafts, rescue injured and stranded loons, host seminars, and work with dam owners to maintain suitable water levels. But prior to this year's strict lead tackle ban, when you do that, you can hear it. So don't kick, okay? Three... Too. But prior to this year's strict lead tackle ban, six full se- seasons of nesting raft management were negated by just 38 pieces of ingested lead. So 38 pieces of lead killed tons of loons. That's what 30, that's saying. 38? It doesn't take much. The only states with lead tackle regulations are New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont, New York, and Washington. Is that Washington State? <coughs> yeah, Washington State. Good. Yeah. Many others, including Minnesota, which has slightly more than half of the, all 48 loons, rely on education. Education means they're just talking to people. All right. We've been educating about this problem since the early 80s, declares Loon Preservation Committee Director Harry Vogel. The only point at which we saw a measurable decrease in lead mortality was when legislati- legislature restricted sale and use. Education by itself doesn't work because lead tackle remains widely available. New Hampshire's ban strengthened in 2016 outlawed the use and sale of lead sinkers and jigs that weighed one ounce or less, uh-huh. which is fantastic. A law that looked to be as good as New Hampshire's went into effect this year in Maine. But after hearings and legislature inserted an exemption for painted jigs in the mistaken notion that paint somehow prevents pebble-sized, pebble-filled gizzards from grinding up lead. We were dumbfounded, says a leading wildlife veterinarian, Dr. Mark Pokras of Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, it's a huge loophole. So they're saying, in Maine, if you have a lead jig that's painted with paint, you can still use it. What? The assumption is that the paint won't 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 get knocked off when you're eating. It's just not. I bet it would because because we've me and Dad have done something. Where, you know, you have people have flattened coins underneath railroads. My dad's flattened a, a lure. The paint turned the paint of it turned into a different flat piece, and the the jig itself. That's right. We put a jig on the uh, train tracks and watched what happened, and it, it actually the paint came off entirely, didn't it? And it flat and it flattened separately. Separately. Uh, in February 2016, the U.S. It was crazy. It was crazy. The U.S. House passed the Sportsman Heritage Recreational Enact- Enhancement Act that would bar the EPA and even Department of Interior for Agriculture from regulating lead ammo and tackle. So let me read that again. In February 2016, the U.S. House passed a Sportsman Heritage and Recreational Enhancement Act that would that would bar EPA and Department of Interior and Agriculture from regulating lead, ammo, and tackle. Lead regulation isn't even happening in most national park units. In March 2009, the Park Service announced that it would ban lead tackle and ammo by the end of 2010. But a trade group, group called the American Sport Fishing Association, the ACA, and the gun lobby, Cotterwald, so that so Carter Wall means they, they they made a big stink about it. So the service backed off, applying the ammo ban only to its employees and requiring contracted concessionaries to restock with non-toxic tackle once they'd sold off their lead. So they tried to ban it, and these big groups fought them, and because they had a lot of money, sounds like they could not ban it. What do you think about that, Zoe? That means they can still use That's lead. That's terrible. Yeah. One hundred percent. It's one of the most terrible things. It sounds terrible. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right. And loons are beautiful. <coughs> right. So, but this column is supposed to be about recovery, right? 
Yep. Yeah, so and incredibly, with all the things they face, loans are recovering in the lower 48. While state-led bans are, are few and sometimes less than adequate, they've helped. Buoys, ropes, warning signs, and nesting refs play a big part. New Hampshire, for instance, has gone from fewer than 100 loon pairs in 1976 to 296. That's a lot. That's fantastic. In fact, we see loons all the time, don't we? Uh-huh. Yeah. Vermont went from 17 pairs in 1984 to 117. And Massachusetts had wow. zero loons in 1975. Zero. Oh, and my gosh. And now they have 43 pairs. Oh, my gosh. All right. With all the restoration effort and the cheap superior tackle alternatives, it's nonsensical for states and federal agencies to, to outlaw lead, to not outlaw lead. Um, non-toxic tackle is a no-brainer, says Prokhorov. I don't understand this op- opposition from the sport fishing community. I'm going to skip a little bit. Maybe the Park Service, Elaine Leslie says it best. The United States is far behind many countries in addressing the lead issues. In its nearly 2000, in its nearly two, it's nearly 2017, and it's time that we, the entire conservation community, which includes hunters and anglers, step up and do the right thing. There are no excuses for our inaction. So, a lot of people think that banning lead is is pe- people who don't like fishermen want to ban lead. Now, do you think I like fishing? Uh huh. How do I feel about the lead ban? Terrible. No. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. You feel good about uh, it. I think That's it's a, a good, good idea. thing. Now, on Facebook, there was a big conversation, okay? Yep. So, I'm going to read you what people said. You tell me what you think. I think they're going to say that it should be banned. All right. So, a guy named Mike says, it's the ones with the hooks are the worst. Lead is bad for the environment and, and all health, period. Yeah, it's kind of annoying, but it would be better for the market in general to move away from lead. The last part is the real problem. He's right. A uh, person named Ray said the law should be like Maine's lead law. Maine says you can use it with paint. He thinks New Hampshire needs to stop trying to be so different from Maine and start looking toward them for guidance, LOL. LOL means laugh out loud. So he, Ray thinks that painted jigs are safe. Ray is wrong. Completely. <coughs> Steve says loons don't eat lead. Shots larger than a number four shot. Lead split sinkers are mostly bigger than that. Too many anti-loon lovers in New Hampshire fishing game. So he says that um, loon is good. Loons don't eat lead. <laughs> uh, another 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 Ray says everything that is made of lead they make in tungsten or bismuth. Bismuth I is the same price as lead. Lead free bass jigs and uh, rain. Uh, no, he's no, he's picking on a bit. Ray, to your thoughts on getting it changed, never ever going to happen. I don't care if you got every fisherman in the state. It still isn't going to change. Now go check out Ken's site and replace your equipment like. I've had to do what everyone else had to do. Uh, So he's saying just suck it up and buy it. Yeah. All right. Rich says, I get upset too when I look at my lead tackle, but think of the time and money spent on lead poisoning and pollution. It's an inconvenience, but filling our waters regularly with a known toxin is just plain irresponsible. I fully support a lead ban, as does the research, so I am happy to see the New England states making a smart decision on not moving backwards. I like that one. That's a good one, yeah. And there's a lot more people who come out and say, "Hey, look, the it's too expensive to buy new lead to buy new jigs," and that's their biggest complaint. And a lot of people also say that people who are are anti lead also are anti fishing. It might be, and I don't want to get too political with you because you're how old are you? I'm ten. Ten. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, but 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 in and then but then President Trump uh, rolled back some of the EPA laws. And they were they were they just outlawed a bunch of lead nationally um, in national parks, and then now it's okay to use it again. So is that because he can became president? It's because he became president. So there's that. I'm not going to read you everything they said, but now I asked Ted Williams what he thought of people who think it's okay to use lead, and here's that conversation. Good. Yeah. So this is Clay calling from the uh, Fish Nerds. How are you? Good. Good. The reason I called, you got you got five minutes right now, or are you sure? Busy? Of course. All right. The reason I called is is that Facebook discussion we saw the other night where people were were talking about fishermen should get together and fight to get lead back, and you had all those great comments on there. And but I kind of wanted to get your take on 
that Facebook discussion of what do you, what do you say to fishermen who want to go old school and get led back from all this? You know, there are a certain breed of cat who uh, perceive a anti uh, blood sport activist behind every Coke machine. And you can't talk rationally to them. Um, it's everything's a conspiracy theory uh, with them. Um, and, and you know, I don't know why people want lead. Um, it, it's inferior to what we have now in a lot of states. And most states still allow it. New Hampshire um, is leading the, the country in, in a um, with good stuff, um, uh, with good law that works. Um, but I mean, um, it, you know, there's tungsten, there's, there's uh, tin, uh, there's even ceramic and stone sinkers. That, I mean, uh, the the EPA has. You know, if you listen to the American Sport Fishing Association, which is really a despicable group, they're they're the aquatic version of the NRA. Um, they lie about it. They say, you know, the, 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 I don't know why they do this. They they say the uh, the non toxics cost twenty uh, times more than than lead. Uh, utter bullshit. Uh, yeah, but but an interesting thing about tungsten is that if you talk to um, you know, Bass Pro shops or um, Orvis, uh, the fishermen are demanding tungsten. Because yeah, it, it's much more efficient. It weighs more, um, and, and um, the EPA reports that um, a switch to non-toxic for the average angler um, is going to cost them 31 cents more per year. And these guys, you know, rather than pay 31 cents, they're they're willing to uh, sacrifice um, loons and other birds. And, and unfortunately, there's a perception out there that this is all about loons. It's not a, just a loon issue. It's a wildlife issue. There, there are two dozen other birds that are poisoned by lead, lead fishing tackle, and uh, it's it's really outrageous. Um, uh, I, don't, um, I don't know why sportsmen are pushing for this. O Obama did the right thing on federal lands, and uh, this idiot uh, Zink, um, the new new um, new guy for a reverse. <laughs> Yeah, it's despicable. Well, it's crazy because they're, they're starting to move towards getting lead out of the hunting world, too. And it's a good move. It's the right direction to go in. Yeah. And it's shocking that sportsmen don't, who should be fighting for the environment are fighting against the environment. And it's yeah. bizarre. Right. Well, I, uh, I went to, I, I've written a lot about this, uh, but I, I went to uh, talk to Mark Prokras, which you should talk to. A, a tough wildlife clinic, a very eminent doctor who knows this, and um, he um, he had a freezer. Fifteen dead eagles fell out on top of me, and you know they were all poisoned by by, by lead sinkers, uh, and then maybe some of them by by lead shot. Um, just one little splinter in a dead deer will kill an eagle. Well, I, I shudder to think about all the times I've bit down on uh, when I was a kid on, on lead sinkers, uh, my, my teeth. Well, good, Ted. Um, I got I to gotta run, but I got what I need from you right now. But I'm, I might circle back to you for some, some stuff because I sure. really think there's a lot to unpack here. Is there going to be a link to this thing? or? Uh, yeah, when I get it out, if you want, I can email it to you. Yeah, um, I, you got my email. so uh, I, I'll find your email, and it'll be at fishnerds.com. I'm off my website and, of course, on iTunes and all over the Internet, you know, once I get it out. Yeah. But okay, I haven't got together yet. I want to go to the Loon Center, interview some of those guys there in person, and get their Harry take. Vogel, and I, Harry, Harry Vogel is the guy you want to talk to. I Vogel? Think. Okay. Harry Vogel, good guy. He's at the okay. uh, Loon Preservation Committee. Yeah, and that's in Moultonboro, right? So that's not too far yeah. away from me. Yeah. And uh, and you gave me another name a minute ago, the person, uh, Eagle Guy, which I'll yeah, follow Art, up. Art progress. progress yeah. yeah. And I'll get a fishing game guy. And I'm debating whether I want to hear – someone who's pro-led's voice <laughs> on uh, it all. And, so, you know, they don't give these crackpots time. I, mean, I think you're right. Yeah. This has to be an answer to that stupidness. So. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the weird thing is on that thread that you're following, that you chimed in on, on yeah. Facebook, one of the guys on there 
is is trying to get his guide license next week. He wants to be a fishing guide. Who was that? Was that Forrest? No, it wasn't Forrest. Another guy. I'm not going <laughs> to sell him out yet. <laughs> but but I am disappointed. I'm like, you can't like you can be a guide. You should be all about like conservation. It's so bizarre. Well, I mean, I've I've used these non toxic sinkers ever since I came out. And Me too. You know, they don't. They're much nicer. They don't dirty up your taco box. Lead, you know, stains everything. It's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, and and it does the 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 stuff doesn't get stuck in rocks as bad as lead. Did. No, it just yeah. works. <laughs> it works. It's not that expensive, and fishermen love buying fishing gear. So sure. the whole argument about I don't want to spend money. That's crazy. They love buying stuff. Yeah, right. They love it. So, all right, Ted, I got to run. I will follow right. up with you. Um, there's there's more I want to talk to you about, but I don't have time right now. All right. Good luck. Yeah. Oh, bye bye. Bye bye. All right. So, hey, big thanks to Ted Williams for coming on, and we'll have a link to his articles at fishnerds.com. Yep. Seems like a nice guy, right? Uh-huh. All right. Hey, next up, we have a new segment on the show, Zoe. It's called Speak Up for the F in Blue. Our friend Andrew Lewin, who hosts the Speak Up for the Blue podcast, he's in, he lives in Canada, has produced a new segment for the show. The fish nerds want to really kind of get more into this conservation thing on this segment it's really hard to talk conservation and not get political. So we're going to do our very best to not yeah. beat, beat up on the president or yeah. politicians, but look really at the policy stuff. And it just so happens that in this, in this, we're going to mention Donald Trump a few times, but if a different president said the same thing, we'd also pick on him. It's not about Donald Trump. It's about the laws and regulations that he's putting in place. So please check out this speak up for the F in blue segment. Hey everybody, this is the first segment of the Speak Up for F and Blue segment here on the Fish Nerds Podcast. I am Andrew Liu and I'm your host of uh, this segment and also the host of the Speak Up for Blue podcast. Clay and I have been talking for a while about uh, providing a segment that was conservation related because I know you guys, we know you guys are all about conservation. So this is going to be the first of many segments uh, for the Fish Nerds podcast, I'm going to update you on news that's going around in the ocean, dealing with issues, dealing with fisheries, dealing with uh, climate change, all sorts of stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hope you enjoy it. Here is there was, today we're going to be actually covering uh, uh, three stories. Um, the one is going to be in uh, in Florida. There's actually sale of shark fins that still go on. Believe it or not, that is still happening. We're going to talk about why that's happening and what's making that happen, and what may actually stop that from happening in the future. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, climate change and U.S. politics. I know you guys love politics as much as I do, uh, but there's something that's interesting came out uh, with uh, Secretary Mattis, who's the secretary, uh, who's the, the in charge of national security, and what he said about climate change and how it should be how it should be dealt with. Uh, and the last one, we're going to talk about some humpback whales that are getting together to do some. Uh, binge feeding, I guess, at a buffet down in South Africa. Uh, we're going to talk all about that uh, on uh, this segment of the Speak Up for F and Blue. So here we go. The uh, first story out of Florida, the sale of shark fin is uh, continuing to flourish despite threat to the ecosystem and tourism. What you guys need to know here, this this is a, a story that I found out of the Jacksonville.com, so I guess it's a newspaper in Jacksonville. Uh, what they're trying to cover is they're saying, look, there's still finning going on, but not the finning in the sense that we all have been, um, I guess, uh, have, we've been exposed to. So what's been happening is that uh, shark finning normally is defined as being out at sea, taking the fins off the sharks, catching the sharks, taking the fins off the sharks while they're still alive, pretty barbaric, and then throwing the bodies back into the ocean, keeping the fins. What that allows fishermen to do is take the fins, as many fins as possible, and load up their load up their boats and bring it back, allowing so they don't have, they don't get weighted down by bringing the actual entire bodies of the shark back. Um, what Florida has done is they've created a law that if you bring the shark, if you bring fins back, you have to bring the entire shark back, which limits the the actual uh, amount of fins that you can get because ideally the price of the fin is going to be more if it's a bigger shark but you can't catch many fins if you don't catch the entire shark right or if you have to, if you have to bring back the in entire shark because it's going to weigh your boat down and it's just you're not going to have any space for the fins so uh, what happens is they'll bring the sharks back they'll 
cut up the shark for meat. They'll also take their fins, but they're taking the whole shark. I know it's terrible to think about what they're doing. However, if you think it from a from a um, a, a waste standpoint, you're having less waste because one, you're not killing the sh- you're not hurting the shark while it's still alive. Two, you're using everything that you can of the shark, and there are shark fisheries out there. Uh, so this is a little better than what it you know the traditional shark finning being out at sea finning the shark while it's still alive and throwing it out it's just it's that is just absolutely barbaric and i'm not defending this please don't think that i'm defending this but this is what's happening uh in florida right now now the catch is uh there's a, a bill that's actually going in this so this this is a state law that they're talking about uh, that they've changed that they have to bring the entire shark back um, but there's a there's a bill. Let me look for it here. There's a bill that's going out in federal bill, which is called the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act. And that if that makes it through legislature, legislature, it's going to trump any kind of state laws. No pun intended. Um, but essentially, what happens is this federal bill will you know prohibit any sale of shark fins to anywhere. So anywhere in the state. The United States, you will not be able to shell, sell shark fin if this goes through. Now, you, it, there, you still have to pass it through legislature, um, and you have to figure out, you know, the the fishing lobby, you know, which fishermen make a lot of money selling fins, a lot more money than they would probably fishing any other kind of fish other than maybe tuna. But even then, um, you know, so it's it's there's the fishing lobby is going to put a lot of pressure, I would imagine, on the federal government not to put this uh, elim- this the shark fin sales elimination act through. However, if it does go through, then all the United States will 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 be prohibited for, for selling shark fin. That'll be a huge huge win for the environment community, for the ocean community, ocean conservation community, um, and we'll see a lot more the health of sharks. Now, what you also have to think about in the title talked about you know this shark finning going on despite the uh, the problems with the ecosystem as well as tourism. Let's talk talk about tourism first. There are other ocean users out there that use sharks, especially in the Florida slash Bahamas area. Shark diving is a huge um, is is a huge economy, and especially in the Bahamas where you have a lot, you can have interactions with a lot of different sharks: tiger sharks, hammerhead sharks, ocean white tip sharks. That is big money for those businesses, as well as in Florida. So you know, you're competing with different ocean users here. You're, one is an extraction uh, economy, which is the fisheries economy, and the other one is a diving economy, which relies on sharks and that renewable sort of source, which has been proven to be um, quite lucrative. And saying, and it actually has proven to be that the shark alive is worth more in this area than than a dead shark. So you got to balance those two those two economies and make sure that they can both flourish in those areas um, or you have to pick one or the other so that will be an interesting uh, choice for governments it'll be really who lobbies best i guess um, so that's the story for that's the first story uh, it's it's kind of an interesting one where it's like you're talking about shark finning and then you know you're, you're talking about stopping the sales of shark fin but you're also talking about other ocean users and of course the ecosystem the sharks are, are dying by the hundreds of millions every year uh, you don't want to see these populations go down. They are apex predators. They will essentially uh, control the amount of prey that are around based on on their hunting skills and their and their just their presence being there. So they kind of keep everything the food web at bay and make sure that you know the the ocean that we know and love stays the same. So uh, we don't want to decrease that. So that's what's the first story out there. The second story has to do with climate change and politics. Like I said, we love politics especially these days with the Trump administration wreaking havoc on environmental bills and environmental departments and whatnot. Uh, the, pretty much the uh, Trump administration has told the U.S. Um, the U.S. citizen that you know they don't want to waste the taxpayers' money by spending it on climate change. They haven't come out necessarily and well, some some secretaries like the the, the chief in, in charge of the EPA, Scott Pruitt, has come out and said that you know. The, the carbon that's being emitted into the atmosphere is not necessarily hasn't been fully proven uh, to be from humans, which is absolutely false. But he decided to say that anyway, um, which frustrates me because he has so much access to the uh, to scientists that know what they're talking about, and he decides to talk out his ass. 
So anyway, uh, so that's that's uh, that's what sort of the Trump administration's position on that. And the federal bill or the federal budget came out slashing many budgets: the NOAA budget, uh, na- the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Ad- uh, Administration budget, uh, and the Environmental Protection Act, but or Environmental Protection Agency budget. So they pretty much said that climate change is on the low priority list or not even on that list. Enter Ma- Mr. Mathis, who is the, and I don't even know his first name, but the Trump's defense secretary is calling climate change a national security risk. Now, this is really not news to us, uh, the public, because when Obama was in charge, the the head of the Navy said that you know climate change was the number one risk to the naval operations. And we had scientific organizations coming out, climate change is the number one risk to um, to the environment, and Obama even came out and said, now, you know, climate change uh, is the is the number one risk to the way the U.S. operates. So this is not really uh, new to us. This is kind of um, this is this is kind of normal. However, it's interesting that the Secretary of Defense, you know, is saying this about uh, how it, how climate change is a risk to national security, and what he means by it is, is military operations. The is James Mattis, sorry, is, is his name, and he believes that uh, uh, that climate change is, is a national security risk because of the way it affects troops on the ground and possible borders uh, control. So you have, uh, or not necessarily border control, but border security. So you have Trumps on the ground or troops on the ground who are stationed in areas where there's massive drought. That can have a serious effect on any kind of military operation. So especially in the Middle East, desert area, you have m- even more drought. That can have a serious effect on the health and well-being of military troops on the ground. You also have a problem with borders, uh, border safety, because up in Alaska, you have melting sea ice, which allows for more boats to go across, more subs to come around. That means areas that you may not be able to, uh, boats that you may not be able to see, subs that you may not be able to see from other countries might be encroaching on your borders. And that is a big security risk. I know, I'm a Canadian citizen, and I know it's been, um, there's been a lot of stories coming out in the last, over the last 10, 20 years as sea ice is melting, uh, about other subs, including the U.S. subs, that are in our borders without permission, without telling us, um, and they're just they're just roaming around doing who knows what. So uh, that is a huge, uh, huge problem for the military. And uh, James Mathis, the Secretary of Defense, sees that. Now, how the government is going to approach that, I have no idea. But this is a, a pretty big story that uh, has kind of gone under the radar for now. It came out March March 14th, but not really many, not many people have talked about it. So I want to let you guys know about this, that maybe this will allow Trump to actually uh, Trump and his administration to actually address climate change because it has to do with military. You know, one, one, something that's interesting before I move on to the next story, something that's interesting about this story is uh, Ellen Prager, Dr. Ellen Prager, who is a uh, an author, a coral scientist, uh, or, or sorry, I, I should say an ocean scientist, and she um, wrote an article in the Huffington Post a while back saying that, you know, the way to really um, motivate the Trump administration to um, tackle climate change is to talk about what they campaigned on. So how it affects the economy, how it affects uh, national health, and how it affects national security. And those are kind of, the way, this is a, one of those ways where you have someone as a Secretary of Defense saying climate change is the number one risk, we need to actually do something about it. So that's going to be interesting to see how that develops. I will keep you updated on that as I go on with these segments. Uh, the last story is, has to do more with the ecology. It's a little bit of a good news story. Uh, researchers are mystified, and that's kind of a, a play on words because the are, are mystic seats that we're talking about. Uh, mystified as solitary whales start swarming in huge numbers, and they're down in South Africa. There are as many as 200 humpbacks that are typically solitary creatures that have uh, been swarming, and researchers aren't exactly sure why. And and um, it, one is one thing is interesting is that you're getting you know, 200 humpbacks at a certain time of year for about three to four years in a row. There's a couple of things that researchers are saying. They don't know exactly why they're doing this, but they're saying there's a couple of things that could be at play. One is climate change, what we just talked about. Climate change could be changing the oceans, could be changing uh, temperatures, and so 
uh, at certain times a year, this might congregate prey or may switch up something uh, as an upwelling or something or, or a different kind of current system that allows food to be there. And these humpback whales are all coming to that. They've adapted and they're coming to where the food is. The other aspect is they're just, this is, is a phenomenon that's been going on for a while and there's just more humpback whales. Humpbacks were, were almost hunted to extinction at one point back in the um, 40s and 50s. They are, they are protected uh, in the IUCN, the International Conservation Union um, for uh, United Nations. Um, and uh, they are, I don't even know if I got that, that acronym right, but IUCN Red List, they're on their IUCN Red List, now as a least concerned species, before they used to be as a threatened species. So they're protected worldwide, and their, their populations have rebounded worldwide. I think as of now, there's considered to be over 60,000 individuals around the world. So that's fantastic. They have worldwide distribution. They usually go down to the tropics uh, to, um, uh, to pup, and then they come up uh, to the um, uh, to the Arctic uh, to feed in the summers. So, you know they're they're quite they're quite prolific. And now you're just seeing them actually come together on a uh, on a basis like in one spot. So you get 200 humpback whales, which is quite the sight, I would imagine. Uh, and they're feeding and they're feeding well. So it's kind of nice to see that these humpback whales are actually coming together. We don't know exactly why they're coming, but I'm sure more research is going to come out. Um, to uh, to determine exactly why they're coming together at this particular time. So they're coming together in South African springtime, um, which is great to see. Uh, and it's just uh, it's fun to see massive animals coming together. Imagine 200 humpback whales that weigh tons. I mean, tons. Um, and and it's just uh, it's amazing to see. Anyway, that is your uh, segment, your Ocean Conservation News Update segment for uh, Fish Nerds. And this is the speak up for blue, the speak up for F and blue. Uh, I am your host Andrew Lewin. Check out my podcast, Speak Up for Blue doc, uh, Speak Up for Blue podcast on iTunes. Uh, thank you very much, Clay, for allowing me to do this. I hope I can uh, make it a little bit better every time. Uh, and and put your and, and and put ocean conservation in your lives each and every week. So we're going to try and do this every week as long as Clay allows me to. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. So thank you very much. And happy conservation. All right. That was really cool. Thank you, Andrew. And again, you can check out Speak Up for the Blue podcast anywhere that podcasts are found. Hey, Zoe, we have a sponsor. Oh, who is that? That's Mystery Tackle Box. Cool. Yeah. Have you heard of this company? Yeah. What is it? It's a company that gives you Mystery Tackle Box. <laughs> That's right. Every month, if you go to mysterytacklebox.com, use promo code FISHNERDS, You'll save five dollars off your first order. That's ten bucks for your box. Wow! And every month they'll send you a package of fishing gear that you don't know what's inside. Hence the mystery. Last one we got was bass fishing gear. Yeah, and I haven't got my I haven't got my March box yet, so I have no idea what we're gonna get in March. But you, if, you, if uh, listeners go to mysterytacklebox.com and enter promo code Fish Nerds, they can save five dollars off right now. Fish Nerds, it's one word. And this is a what's called an affiliate sponsor. You know what that means, Zoe? Nope. That means they're not paying us any money at all. The fish nerds don't get a dollar, anything, until someone buys the product. So if you om- use promo code Fish Nerds, the Mystery Tackle Box actually pays us. And that's how it keeps the show going. Uh-huh. But what really keeps the show going is our listener support from Patreon. Patreon.com yep. forward slash Fish Nerds. And our listeners help support the podcast. So if you like to support the show, do that. Give us a dollar an episode. It's $4 a month and help us keep this going. I want to take one second and thank our newest Patreon subscriber, Sean Bradbury. Sean, thank you so much for your support. Your money makes a big difference. And I also want to thank our big, giant Patreon supporter at $25, Josh Lopes. And if you donate at that level, you get your business mentioned. So I'm going to mention his business. Josh Lopes is at LopesTax.com. If you're in the Hanover, Massachusetts area and you want a good tax guy who's a good friend of the fish nerds, you should go to Josh Lopes' website, which is LopesTax.com, and hire him to do your taxes. He's also a personal friend of mine, so I think I can vouch for him. Uh, And damn good looking man. But we are out out of podcast time today. So that's it. You've listened to a couple of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. 
We'd like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast. Go on Fishing Quest and do all sorts of silly things that nerds do. If you would like to support Fish Nerds, you can go to patreon.com and search for Fish Nerds and help us crowd fund this podcast. Special thanks to Ted Williams, Ice Fishing New Hampshire Facebook group, Speak Up for the Blue podcast, and Rich College, of course, Zoe. Thank you for co-hosting tonight. And until next time, follow, follow the code, the Fish Nerd. Spawn early and often. Avoid free lunches with strings attached. Swim against the current every chance you get. You did it. You made a podcast. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks.